right, it's officially um, noon. I'm really excited to um, introduce two of our um, um, two um, faculty members, our very own here at UCSF. Um, and um, I will start with Dr. Marissa Raymond Flash. Um, she's an associate professor in the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine within the Department of Pediatrics. Clinically, she practices adolescent and, um, in adolescent and young adult medicine with patients 12 to 26 years old, including treatment of depression, anxiety, and eating disorders, providing all types of contraception, and providing primary care for patients with complex medical and mental health conditions. Her research focuses on access to care for adolescents and young adults with a particular interest in improving mental health and reproductive health care for minority and rural communities. She's currently designing a clinical trial to test the use of psilocybin-assisted therapy for the treatment of anorexia nervosa in young adults. And Dr. Amanda Downey is a pediatrician and a child and adolescent psychiatrist who cares for adolescents and young adults with eating disorders. She works with patients and their families to develop a treatment plan that honors their unique strengths and challenges through education, advocacy, and research. She strives to dismantle the systems that increase risk for eating disorders and improve evidence-based eating disorders treatments. She's the assistant medical director for the UCSF Eating Disorders Program and the medical team lead for the UCSF Translational Psychedelic Research Program. Very excited to um, have you here today, part of our series, and learn more about um, this cutting edge treatment and approaches. I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself, um, but please help um, join me everyone in a warm welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Barbara, for that um, lovely introduction. Amanda and I are really excited to be here today um, to talk with you about eating disorders and psychedelic assisted therapy, what we see as the synergies and the urgently needed investigations, and to tell you about the trial that we are working on launching. Um, so our roadmap for today, we're going to start with talking about um, a little bit about eating disorder, the current epidemiology. I think that will be familiar to many on, on the call. And then we're going to talk some about what treatments we have now, the neurobiology of AN, and uh, why we think psilocybin has a lot of potential. And then we'll end the talk um, telling you a bit more about our study and what we're working on. So I'm sure it's a surprise to absolutely no one on this call to know that um, eating disorders have increased during the pandemic. We've seen this very dramatically at UCSF, um, where our inpatient daily census went from about 1.4 patients on average in uh, 2017, and has now been at about eight patients per at, at daily average for quite a while now. We kind of expected this to go down as the pandemic waned, um, but that is not the case. We've actually learned what our maximum census is as a result of the pandemic. And really, we've been taking care of um, sicker patients, more patients in the PICU um, than we have in past years. Um, so you know, we're really feeling this in real time in our work, but it's also showing up in the evidence base. Um, overall incidence of eating disorders uh, began increasing at the beginning of the pandemic. This is sort of, um, uh, British data, um, and there's some American data as well, um, and it has continued to worsen. Again, we are not seeing this slow down. It may be plateauing, but it's not falling off. During the pandemic, this was primarily driven by um, women and girls with anorexia, and particularly you can see that um, the youngest age groups are impacted here, um, the 10 to 14 year olds, 15 to 19 year olds. Um, and we were also seeing um, more psychological illness presenting with AN, increased incidence of suicidal ideation and attempts, for example. So here's the, here's the real kicker about that data, right? Because with an AN population, unless folks are able to access evidence-based treatment within three years of illness onset, outcomes are poor regardless of access to treatment. So this is the perfect storm, right, for young people to be set up for kind of lifelong chronic illness. Our increasing volume of patients during the pandemic severely outpaces the amount of resources we have available. And delayed recognition is common in this illness. I think about our patients who are gender diverse or non-English speaking, patients in larger bodies. These are folks that classically go missed by even well-meaning providers, right? Because of the stereotype of, of 
what is the look of someone who develops an eating disorder. So folks are already struggling with access to care and, and just trouble being recognized within the medical system. And then you add in something like public insurance, right, which is a huge issue for our patients accessing needed care. And you can see how this perfect storm would create this system where folks are not getting care within the first three years of their illness. And that really can be the difference between a chance at remission and, and kind of long-term suffering um, and even progression to chronic illness and death. Next slide, please. Um, I, I like to make a self joke here that as a total psychopharmacology nerd, um, I don't know what I was thinking going into the field of eating disorders, because the reality is that no medications have been shown to improve really core symptoms of anorexia nervosa. Second generation antipsychotics, some of you might remember kind of 15, 20 years ago, there was this push to think about AN as this borderline psychotic illness, right, in terms of really profound body dysmorphia and excitement around the use of second generation antipsychotics to treat our patients. But unfortunately, randomized clinical trials just have shown you know, a weak signal at best. If these medications were effective for our patients, everyone would be on them. We see maybe an accelerated rate of weight gain on antipsychotics, but absolutely nothing compared to uh, the use of antipsychotics in other clinical populations. Maybe a little bit of fostering of insight in, in our severely ill patients with aripiprazole, but again, really not enough to significantly move the needle for our patients. Remember, there's some evidence for the use of floxetine in reducing binge purge episodes in bulimia nervosa in particular, even in the absence sense of mood disorder or mood symptoms. So that really is the best win we have to offer in the eating disorder field in terms of psychopharm to date. Next slide, please. So what is it about AN? What's different about these patients, right? Where they're just not responding to medications and, and not responding robustly to our conventional treatments. Well, it's interesting because there's something about restrictive eating that is a means of coping, it is a means of reducing negative mood. So that kind of grounds me in the work, right? Having an eating disorder really isn't a choice. There's, there's some neurobiologic abnormalities going on here. First and foremost, we think that there is definitely skewed interactions between both the serotonin and the dopaminergic pathways. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So for example, we know that folks with AN tend to have increased 5-HT1A binding and diminished 5-HT2A binding, particularly in the medial prefrontal cortex. So what does that mean? This is a little bit hypothetical, but we think there's kind of a, a more profound hyperpolarization of neurons in the frontal lobe that tends to yield this increased anxiety state or this really compulsive perseveration that, that is really part and parcel of the disorder. Now, fMRI suggests also dysregulated reward pathways, particularly in the awareness of homeostatic needs. So what does that mean? When you throw healthy controls into an fMRI machine and give them a highly palatable food, so let's say for me, that would be a donut, <laughs> for example. So characteristically, again, in healthy controls, we see that good ventral striatal dopamine release that's then associated with kind of an elevated mood, or some might even say euphoria when they're presented with a, something that's highly rewarding like that. Now, interestingly, when you put our patients with AN in an fMRI scanner and they're presented with that same stimulus, some kind of highly palatable food, they still do get that endogenous dopamine release. So that all seems to be fine, but they perceive that dopamine release as highly anxiogenic as opposed to hedonic. So that really could underlie, right, this this need to starve or to refuse food, it might actually be a way to kind of treat the, this intense distress and anxiety that they hold. Um, but that is, we think, a dysregulation of their reward pathways. And so ultimately that yields this really enhanced executive ability to in inhibit incentive motivational drives, like, like the, that, you know, very basic survival, right? Honoring our hunger cues. They have this incredible ability to dampen that response. So let's zoom out a little bit and, and look at the whole brain. So we know that in AN, in this setting of acute starvation, we see both white and gray matter loss. 
Although something about the gray matter loss is particularly pronounced in adolescents and young adults. We see reductions of almost 11% um, in young people compared to 3.1% in adults. Now with full weight restoration, we can get white matter back to pre-morbid levels and volumes, but that loss of gray matter is persistent. And we see that correlate with long-term effects on cognitive functioning. So that's a bummer regardless, right? But then if you take our younger population, our adolescents, our young adults, we're rapidly undergoing neurodevelopment, right? They're pruning, um, trying to develop complex neural networks to build resilience and coping skills. You can see that malnutrition would have this profound impact on the brain's ability to do those things, to form that um, higher level kind of cognitive networks that, that they need to be successful moving forward. So the effects of untreated AN are, are profound and, and really hard to quantify. So let, let's finally connect this with, with our psychedelic work. So let's talk about classic psychedelics. We're talking about mescaline, LSD, psilocybin in the case of our study, which you'll hear more about, and DMT. The main mechanism of action, I'm being a little bit simplistic, but we think it's through agonism at the 5-HT2A or the serotonin 2A receptor. They act as partial agonists with high affinity for that receptor. So what we know from the data is that as, as that receptor occupancy increases, so does the subjective experience, or um, I'll use a, a lay term here, the, the trip, the hallucinogenic trip gets higher as those receptors um, get more saturated. And then conversely, when we add a serotonin to a antagonist, something like catanserin, some of you might be familiar with, we do see attenuation of that psychological response or, or an uh, almost abrupt halt of that trip, right? So um, that is the theory. There's, uh, of course, a lot of complexity at play and a lot of work still being done to tease out exactly what's going on, but certainly serotonin is implicated. If you were at Dr. Ross's lecture last week, you might um, recall that some of his work uncovered that right where the SSRI attached to serotonin receptors on the outside of the cell membrane, these molecules are able to penetrate the cell um, and, and go connect with intracellular receptors. And there's something about those receptors that are special and, and allow psychedelics to exert a different kind of downstream effect, which is really exciting. Our lab and others are looking at other mechanisms of action, which might be at play, things like inflammation. We know classic psychedelics are potently anti-inflammatory, and they also um, yield this kind of or open this critical window where we can um, we see neuroplasticity. I know that's a really heterogeneous construct, but we do see synaptogenesis and an increase um, in dendrites shortly after administration of these substances, and that's obviously an area ripe for further work. Uh, Perfect. Um, so let's bring these two things together then. Why do we think classic psychedelics or psilocybin in particular might be so useful for our folks with deeply entrenched anorexia nervosa? Um, so again, we've already said that there's a dysregulation or a decrease in that serotonin to a binding, particularly um, in the frontal cortex, but also in the parietal and occipital cortices. That yields this really profound cognitive rigidity in our patients. But psilocin, the active metabolite of psilocybin, again, is a strong agonist at that 5-HT2A receptor, um, both on the membrane and intracellularly. We think that that is going to portend some positive effects. And then patients with AN have disrupted connectivity between their um, executive control network and their default mode network. And again, just to give a brief overview, that default mode network, we think, is kind of where our ego lives, where our mind goes when we're not consciously engaged in another task. So... Um, you know, self-referential thoughts happen in the default mode network. So you might imagine for our patients, those are thoughts like, um, I'm too fat. No one could ever love me. I need to change the way I look, right? Things like that. And if that brain network isn't diffusely or appropriately connected or speaking to other brain networks, you could see how that those kind of thoughts get this undue salience, right? That's not serving our patients. So what's really cool about psilocybin, go ahead to next slide, please which you'll see the image on the right as compared to placebo or control on the left-hand side is that psilocybin has this unique effect, not only of being able to quiet that default mode network, but also increase between network functional connectivity in the brain. Another way to say that is uh, to decrease segregation or decrease uh, modularity of brain networks. These are networks that are usually really well segregated from each other, right? But if we can kind of enhance functional connectivity between 
between these different brain networks, between the default mode network and executive control networks, we can find a window to establish more appropriate salience of hedonic drives, things like appetite and hunger cues, which obviously are critically important in treating our patients with AN. Next slide, please. So we are thrilled to show you this data that we had been waiting for out of UC San Diego. This is the first um, open label feasibility trial of psilocybin in patients with AN. A couple notes on this study so you can then kind of see how our study builds on these findings. They ran 10 adult female participants only. Folks had AN or AN impartial remission. They received a single 25 milligram dose of synthetic psilocybin in conjunction with psychological support. It was overall incredibly safe. EKGs looked fine. Vital signs were safe. There was no increase in suicidality. Two participants did develop asymptomatic hypoglycemia, self-resolved, um, but something we're thinking about in our sample. Um, but really all the adverse effects were, were mild and transient and participants really thought that the treatment was acceptable, which is a big deal in the eating disorder world. In terms of efficacy, there was more heterogeneity here. Weight concerns did decrease significantly from baseline to the end of the um, study with a medium to large effect. And four participants did show EDE scores or the eating disorder examination. It's our kind of uh, gold standard symptom screener. Um, they did find that those scores decreased to within one standard de deviation of community norm. So um, overall, this is a, a really positive signal for us um, and gives us a lot to build on moving forward. Great. Um, so I'm gonna transition us from that to how we're building the study and some of the things that are salient and important to us as we move forward. So our group focuses on um, the care of young people between 12 and 26 years old in the eating disorder program here at UCSF, occasionally younger patients, simply because they have nowhere else to be treated. Um, and this means that when we are thinking about uh, the neurobiology of AN, we're particularly thinking about it in this critical period of neurodevelopment during adolescence and into young adulthood. Um, we know that this is a time of incredible change in the brain. There's um, unstable networks. We're seeing maturation of the prefrontal cortex um, and its executive ability is sort of coming online more and more able to inhibit the limbic system. We're seeing synaptogenesis um, and large scale neural pruning to create more um, efficient pathways within the brain. And um, this kind of interacts with the effects of myelination, um, and is, of course, all impacted by malnutrition. Um, and, you know, I think what we know about this period broadly is that it's a period where neural pathways that are used and reinforced are strengthened because of the pruning that's happening. And this means when a young person is really struggling with a mental illness, those are some of the pathways that will be reinforced. And it's one of the reasons, for example, that there's high uh, vulnerability to addiction during adolescence and young adulthood. But we also know from other studies that things like social connection um, promotes positive coping skills is likely to help adolescents and young adults build other strategies um, aside from those rooted in um, mental illness. So Amanda gave us an excellent and detailed explanation of psychedelics. I'm gonna offer a metaphor. Um, and uh, I think this is, I offer this because um, there's so much to take in about this field and about how it's working on the neurobiologic level, but I also always need something to come back to, to be able to explain this to families, to patients, and to lay community members. And so I'm going to share a metaphor that was developed by one of our colleagues here at UCSF, uh, Robin Carhart Harris. And he's spoken of psychedelics as shaking the snow globe and disrupting old stuck ways of thinking. So as Amanda was saying, this is really the default mode network, right? In depressed patients, it might sound like I'm worthless, life isn't worth living. In our patients with AN, it might sound like I'm fat, I'm ugly, no one could ever love me. And what we know that psilocybin does um, is it um, really changes the connectivity in the brain and the neocortex, as Amanda showed us on that earlier slide, and just shakes things up. And then we have this period of plasticity. Um, we're not really sure how long that period is yet, but we do know that for a period of time, what I think of as like the snow settling, um, the way that we intervene might really matter. Um, and we bring this up because um, some of the early data from studies with MDMA and other things suggests that patients might continue to improve um, after they exit these therapies, which is very unusual. 
and very exciting and very atypical of behavioral health interventions. We really see regression to the mean most of the time. And that's left our group thinking a lot about the context that this study is happening in for any given patient's life. Amanda, do you want to? Yeah. This yeah. So let's um, let's talk about just what a, a typical trial kind of looks like. I think that will be a helpful frame. Okay, so this is just kind of a skeleton of a, of a typical um, psychedelic clinical trial, and I'll, I'll walk you through it briefly. So, of course, uh, like any trial, right, medical screening, baseline assessments, all of those good things. And then you move into a phase that we call preparatory therapy or PrEP for short. And that's not altogether different from, from what you guys are doing clinically as you see patients, you're, you're you know, using it as an opportunity to really cultivate a trusting relationship with the, we call them facilitators or therapists during the course of the study. You want to set expectations for dosing day. So folks have a really good sense of where they're heading. And a really critical part of this, um, this phase is to, is to set intentions. And really that's participant driven and approached, I think, with a lot of humility and a lot of curiosity on behalf of the facilitator. Um, sometimes that just looks like, what does healing look like for you? Um, and kind of making our own agendas backseat to what the participant brings um, to the experience. Then you have a dosing day for psilocybin, just to give an example, that's typically about eight hours based on the half-life. So it's, it's quite a long and involved dosing day. And then that's followed by a series of integration therapy sessions. Um, and really those, again, were not terribly directive, but we're taking the gained insights, the emotions, the experience on dosing day and helping the participant to process and make sense of that information and to figure out how they wanna carry that forward into desired areas of their life. Um, someone reminded me of this recently that, you know, the word integration, right, shares the same Latin root with integrity. So this idea of bringing parts together to make a whole, I think is, uh, is the most beautiful description of what integration therapy offers after dosing day. So set and setting, this is probably a phrase that you've heard thrown around. Um, this was actually probably coined back in the 1960s with the first wave of psychedelic work. Um, but set is really anything related to the internal state of the participant that they are bringing to the experience. And it's important for, for the study team and the facilitator to be aware of the, the set that the participant shows up with, right? Um, because we, we work with that. And then setting um, is a little bit more simple perhaps, but it's it's just the physical environment in which the psychedelic is given. Um, and, and that can extend, right? That's the physical space. It's also the eye shades that participants might um, wear for dosing day so that they're really having an more internally focused experience. It's the music that's playing, asking them to wear, you know, comfy clothes for an eight hour dosing day. We want them to be comfortable. Do you dim the lights or do you have the lights really bright? And how might that affect a participant's response, right? So all of these things, even though they might seem trivial, right? We know that sudden setting actually powerfully influences not only the experience, but probably also clinical outcomes. Um, and so as you can imagine, it's really hard to, to separate sudden setting from the clinical outcome. Um, it's really hard to, to study that alone, but um, that is a conversation that's going on in the field um, and something that we need to be mindful of um, during our trial because of its influence. So a lot of special considerations for our, our participants with AN in particular. You know, I think first and foremost, again, this is, we're coming with a lot of humility and curiosity. This is not necessarily focused on changing EB symptoms. That's not the agenda that we're bringing to our participants. Um, intentions and goals are, are really, again, broadly defined and driven by the participant. And those of you who are familiar with our FBT model, right, it's particularly for adolescents and young adults, it's an incredibly directive approach. I um, often tell my patients, if, if you're very fond of family-based treatment, FBT at the beginning, you're not doing it right, right? So this, this, is, <laughs> this is kind of a radically different approach um, in some ways where we're really like allowing participants to kind of honor their natural healing wisdom. And I think that's gonna be really, really interesting in this space. Um, we wanna know how to foster safety and openness in this population that uh, you know I've already alluded to. They're predisposed to risk aversion and rigidity and intolerance of uncertainty, I think. And um, that's gonna be an, an interesting path for us to walk. And then lastly, right, what are the considerations for facilitating longer term integration? I'm not sure we have an answer to that yet, um, but hopefully we'll see more um, more research and more work about that um, coming. 
Um, so we've talked with you about the overall trend that we've seen at UCSF that is being seen um, nationwide and worldwide related to eating disorder over the last few years. Um, but at this point in the talk, I want to zoom in a little bit more. This is our you know, inpatient uh, census at UCSF, and we're going to look at just one story um, to help you guys understand how uh, we pivoted to doing this work. Um, I was on service in the spring of 2022, and we were caring for a young woman who was extremely ill. And um, in the depths of her illness, she was really clear that she would rather die than eat. And of course, our job um, as physicians and as an eating disorder program is to keep our patients alive. And um, we needed to provide her with food and hydration to maintain her vital signs. And so um, one of the mornings when I was on service, um, our only option at that time was to place a feeding tube, which we do when we absolutely have to. We did that with permission from, she, from her parents. And I found myself in her room with eight other nurses um, trying to support her to have that feeding tube placed. And um, as soon as that tube was in place, she did something that I've, I've never had a patient do before. She coughed it up and bit holes in it so that we could not feed her. And, um, you know, this was really a moment of powerlessness for me as a physician. I'm pretty used to having these patients in the hospital and knowing what to do. Um, even if what to do is hard, um, even if it requires a lot of support for the family. Um, and I'm not used to having such a feeling of powerlessness and such uncertainty about how to keep a patient safe. And so in my own life, um, I kind of have a mantra I come back to in my moments of powerlessness. I ask myself, what power and privilege do I have? And am I using it to the best of my ability? And I had been reading about the compelling studies that had been coming out about psychedelic assisted therapy in the literature of the MDMA trial, um, where we were a site um, at UCSF, um, some of the psilocybin studies done in depression and addiction. And um, I, I just kept thinking and wondering if our patients could benefit from that. And that day, what I did um, to process my own feelings and my own sense of, of helplessness is I asked one of our therapists from the program, um, uh, Sarah Forsberg, who many of you know, I know, um, just to go out to lunch with me <laughs> so that I could get myself, uh, my feet on, on the ground and continue to support the team and our patients. And um, I told Sarah that I, I had this crazy idea, I told her, I keep thinking about doing a study to test psychedelics for our patients with anorexia. And many of you know Sarah, she's an excellent psychotherapist and I'm, you know, I'm not a psychotherapist. So I expected her to say something that I thought might be kind of therapist-y like, like you know, fantasy is an important part of coping, or I'm not sure exactly what, but something like that. And she really surprised me. Um, and what she said instead was, I, I know how to do therapy and you know how to do research. So you have to figure out how to do this study. Um, and that conversation was the seed for Spagna, um, the study of psilocybin for anorexia nervosa in young adults. Um, and when this study kind of began to come together, we're so fortunate to be at UCSF where there are a, an incredible array of talented people that can help us with this. We've recruited physicians from the Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine Program, myself, Amanda, Sarah Buckaloo, psychiatrists, um, especially Josh Woolley, whose lab um, focuses on, on using psychedelics for often very hard to treat illnesses. Um, you know, he's run trials in methamphetamine use disorder in patients with Parkinson's disease. And so, when I showed up on his doorstep and told him I wanted to do this, his first response was like, that's so cool. And then when I showed up the third and fourth time, he said, you, you really want to do this, don't you? <laughs> um, and he's been a wonderful partner and brought um, a huge talented team to complement ours. Um, so we have four therapists from our eating disorder program who are partnering with us to do the psychotherapy in this study. Um, and then Josh also has um, a team of psychotherapists and psychedelic facilitators who are joining us. Gisela Fernandez is um, the lead facilitator in her group, and they've been incredibly helpful in getting, helping us get up to speed and shepherd this study through. So as we were coming together as a group, we really honed in on a few key study elements that were very important to us um, and um, that we thought were critical to really doing a well-designed trial in this age group. We first, we wanted to hone in on the 18 to 25 year old age group. It's this critical developmental window as we've discussed. 
Um, we know from the rest of our work in adolescents and young adults that family involvement is really key. We know that um, anorexia is incredibly disruptive to the transition to young adulthood. Um, something like 20% of patients aren't able to earn a living. Many of them are financially dependent on their parents. So families <laughs> remain really critical and involved in treatment. We also were UCSF and I'm historically a health disparities researcher. So we're coming at this with an equity lens um, and launching the trial with Spanish language capability, which we mostly anticipate using with families. Um, most of our patients in our patient population speak English, but many families are uh, monolingual Spanish speaking. And uh, we also, because we think of those, of what's happening while that snow settles, to go back to our other metaphor, we're trying to think about the layers outside of the patient. So I mentioned family, but we're also considering um, issues related to who their treatment team is before and after our study. Um, and we'll share some data with you about how we're starting to think about partnering with therapists and physicians in the community who are treating these patients. So we did what anyone would do. We went to PubMed, we started our deep dive in the literature. Um, and we were looking at sort of the three most studied substances um, at that time that we thought made the most sense um, biologically for treating AN um, and looked at what was out there. We were interested in if these studies had been done in all subtypes of AN, AN restrictive, AN binge purge, other eating disorders. We were interested in if any other studies had engaged um, families, had actually tested the young adult population um, and had done any other studies in Spanish. Um, and I mostly put this up because um, I think the amount of white on this slide is quite remarkable. Um, there was very little that had been done yet. Um, and many of the trials that had been done at that point were only going down to age 21. So really starting to get a sense of um, if younger patients could benefit from this um, and if a family could help that process was something that was still pretty new. So building on what Amanda shared about a typical trial design, this is where we're headed with Spania for the active treatment phase of the study. Um, everyone will come in and of course have medical and psychological screening. Um, we are trying to be as inclusive as we can. We're gonna be taking patients with all subtypes of AN, including um, enrolling patients with atypical AN. Um, we are trying to enroll patients who are quite ill down to a BMI of 12. Um, they basically can't be needing to be in the hospital. Um, but that we are taking almost anyone else that we can. Um, we will have a preparatory therapy period and that will involve family. Family will be involved um, in two sessions. Um, there will be one session that's really psychoeducation for families and an opportunity for families to sort of share all of their fears, um, learn more about the process. And then there will be a joint uh, therapy session with the family and the young adult participant. Um, and part of the goals of that, um, and I, I know our, some of our therapists are on and can speak more to this in the Q&A, but part of the goals of that are to really um, have the participant work with the family members to think about how they can be supportive during this process. Um, and prepare everybody for the fact that um, they may really experience a lot of change as a result of involvement in this study and to help prepare these families that are probably have probably experienced a lot of medical trauma, a lot of stress, may have kind of gotten themselves into sort of calcified roles around an illness, and um, to prepare all of them for change and flexibility. After the prep therapy, our participants will have two dosing days because of um, the medical acuity in this population, we're gonna start with a lower dose, um, probably somewhere around 15 to 20 um, milligrams. We've kind of been going back and forth a little on that first one. And then um, we'll be moving to a 25 milligram dose for the second dosing day, which is very is the sort of common and standard dose. Um, and there will be integration sessions after each of these. At the very end of the study, we'll bring back family, again, for the purpose of the young adult participant um, sharing what they want to with their family members um, and thinking with their family members again as they exit the trial, how can you continue to be supportive of my healing? What is it that I need um, from you in this process? And so, you know, just to highlight a few things about this trial that I think are really a step forward from the feasibility trial we, we presented earlier. Um, we're going to have twice as many dosing days. We're going to have this purposeful family involvement. We're going to be focusing down on this patient population with developing neocortices, and um, we're going to be doing it bilingually, all of which are things that are really novel. Thanks, Marisa. 
Um, so as part of this work and, and being really inclusive and really thinking about the village that it takes to take care of our patients, we decided to do um, a focus group study with ED providers, so meaning psychotherapists, social workers, and physicians all over the state of California to get a sense of where they were at with this idea, right? It, it was kind of a dual purpose study in that it allowed us to bring this idea, bring the trial to our community um, and just, just gauge their feedback and get the word out, but also to learn a lot about how we can implement this in a way that, that will allow us to rapidly translate the findings into clinical practice should psilocybin be deemed safe and effective um, to do so. So um, we conducted five focus groups in total. Marisa, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and we, we learned a lot from them, right? Therapists want to know who to refer, who is it safe to refer. They want to know some information about what our studies look like. And they want collabor um, collateral information from us, and we want collateral information for them. So once their participants are in the study with us, they really want to have access to the study team to be able to exchange information. One idea that was really well received by our participants is that, um, uh, our focus group participants, is, is to have folks enrolled in the trial during integration therapy write up a little summary of their journey. So not only as a way to continue that integration work, but for the participant to have created something to then take to their outpatient therapist to have that dialogue about what they've learned and how to carry that work forward. Following the therapy, um, medical providers and therapists want to know what to look out for, right? What are what are unanticipated adverse events that they should just keep their um, keep on their radar and strategies to support further integration work. And that's where things get a little bit hairy. And we had to kind of dialogue with, with the focus groups about the inherent unknowns in clinical research. We just don't know what is the best therapeutic modality to utilize going forward following this clinical trial. Um, and yeah, that, that came up a number of times. Um, they want follow up with us. They want opportunities for continuing medical education about this work. And they wanna know that it's safe and effective for their patients, right? We, um, we are all in deep relationship with our patients or clients, um, whatever term you use, and, and they feel protective for those patients for good reason. So um, this gives us a lot of work to do um, in terms of providing information, opportunities for collaboration as a study team with, again, this village who, who really take care of our patients. So to bring this back to the context of our study, um, you know, there were many poignant quotes um, from participants in those focus groups. Um, but here is one that I think really summarizes a lot of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about our patient in the context of their family and the healthcare system um, and, and their healthcare providers and other structural factors. Um, that participant said, I will be part of the team whether I'm on the faculty or not. In my viewpoint, I need to be on the front end and on the back end, which I think is really true. I think when we conduct clinical trials and we don't think about the key stakeholders, um, we're missing an opportunity to make a more pragmatic and effective intervention. And so we really appreciated all of all that these focus group participants shared with us. And, and we are working to modify our um, our study design to incorporate that. So as Amanda mentioned, we're incorporating um, participant created summary document. Um, we're going to work with um, our therapist to offer a verbal handout to outpatient therapists when when the young adult participant wants us to. Um, and we're also beginning to curate a list of publications and resources for referring providers um, so that they can feel like they have some basic information and evidence based reliable information about psychedelic assisted therapy. There's as, as they told us, there's a lot of information out there about it, and it can be very hard to discern um, what is most accurate and factual. And, you know, I think in the, they gave us a lot of fun ideas that we want to think about in the future. They, we want to think about, could we ever run a long-term support group for people who are continuing to do integration work? Could we ever run a consultation group um, for therapists who are doing more integration with their patients over time? Um, can we run formal CE programs to make sure that therapists can access current um, information? I think all of these are longer term goals, um, but very important in, in this field as a whole. 
And I, we also want to share with you some of the community engagement that we're doing in Spain. Again, my own background is like community based participatory research and health disparities. As, as I've told my team, I've never run a study without an advisory board and I'm not about to start now. Um, so we're going we are in the process of recruiting an advisory board of young adults um, who have lived experience with anorexia nervosa. Um, and we will also be recruiting an advisory board of family members who have supported a young person through treatment for anorexia nervosa. Um, our goal here is to have um, advisors that wouldn't want to be in the trial or wouldn't want their child to be in the trial right now, um, but who can still give us their feedback about um, the study design, help us problem solve creatively as things that we don't anticipate arise in the study design. Um, and so we've had a great time um, recruiting patients for this so far. Um, I will put the word out here also um, that uh, we really want to have a diverse representation on this advisory board. So you should feel free to connect us with any patients, especially those of different races and ethnicities or who have different versions of anorexia, binge purge subtype, atypical, so that we can have a broad representation in this group that reflects um, our own program here at UCSF that's um, our patients are 45% non-white, and we really want that to be reflected in our advisory board and in our study. In addition, um, we're going to be doing exit interviews with both the young adults and the parents who participate in this trial. Parents will be consented participants in the, in the study. Um, they will be um, doing questionnaires to give us their feedback about how they're doing in terms of burnout and caregiver support and how they think that their child is doing. Um, and in these exit interviews, um, we're going to be asking all of our participants how the study impacted them, their illness or their child's illness, um, what was most helpful to them about it, and really honing in on what we can improve, um, how we can do better in the future. So pragmatically, um, our next steps in this work, um, our IRB application has been approved miraculously. Um, we are awaiting FDA approval. We're in the middle of hiring um, clinical research coordinators and working on building our database. Um, and we anticipate enrollment in Spania beginning in sometime like quarter one, quarter two of 2024, which we're really excited about. And I also just want to pause and offer a few slides about our longer term goals in this work. I think our whole team really sees this as a first step in a much larger body of research. Um, you know, we are thinking about this in this context of the patient, the family, the therapist, and structural factors. Um, we'd like to scale up eventually to a larger trial um, or be part of a multi-site trial. This study will enroll somewhere between 20 and 40 patients. Um, and we want to refine our engagement with families, think about those ideas around support groups for families, for patients, refine engagement with community therapists. And then in the long term, you know, we shared with you that the average age of onset for anorexia is, is trending downward. Um, it used to be somewhere around 15, 14. Now we think it's probably more like 12. Um, and as Amanda mentioned, there's this three year window for optimal treatment to really shift the course of disease. So if people are getting sick when they're 12 and we have three years to really change the course of disease, for some of our patients, treatment at 18 years old may be too late. Um, and so if this work is safe in our young adult studies and the other adult studies that we know are happening across the country, we do have a long term interest in testing the safety and efficacy in older teens with severe anorexia nervosa. Um, and, you know, I want to offer this in particular as a pediatrician. On average, nine additional years are required for a novel drug to be approved in a pediatric population after adult approval. Every one of these years is a year that we will lose patients. I'm sure some of you have heard the statistic that a person with an eating disorder dies on average every 52 minutes in the United States. Nine years is way too many patients. It's way too many hours. So we want to be prepared to study these medications in younger populations as soon as it's safe and reasonable to do so. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. We tried to leave plenty of time for questions, and it looks like there's a lot happening in the chat. So. This is fantastic. I'm blown away, um, as most of you probably are. Um, I just want to share that 107 people are 
um, here today um, listening to this. So this is um, a testament to the amazing work that you both have done and the entire eating disorders program as well and adolescent medicine. Amendous, am tremendous, amazing. Amendous, can we use that word? <laughs> work. Um, I'm going to open it up uh, to questions. There are lots of um, uh, comments of gratitude. I just want to highlight um, uh, Dr. Hernandez Dimler's uh, comment. Miriam, do you want to say anything? I'll just read. Sure. Oh, yes. there you are, Miriam. I'm Go here. I'm listening. Okay. No, I just wanted to show some gratitude. I think that whenever you bring your counter-transference, your personal experience in the clinical work and are able to share it out, especially with so many folks. And there's vulnerability in that and humility. And I just wanted to showcase that. Nice to see you again, Marissa, but I, it doesn't surprise me you did that, but I just wanted to thank you for going there. And it made the interventions that you're doing, the research that you're, you're doing just uh, more real and accessible to us. So thank you. Thank you. There are a couple of questions. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not doing this in order. So um, Kevin K, would you like to unmute yourself and you can ask your question? Okay, I'll ask on their behalf. Um, is significant insomnia associated with anorexia nervosa in young adults? If yes, will it be measured in your study? Yeah, it's a great question. We do see significant insomnia that um, is pretty tightly correlated with the degree of malnutrition. So again, that's when I showed that slide with um, loss of, of gray and white matter, we think it's part and parcel um, of the starvation process. Um, are we measuring that in our study? That's a really good question and a really good thought. Marisa, do we have any specific insomnia skills? No, we don't. But if anyone has a lot of interest in it, has some suggestions for something succinct that we could integrate, we would be really open to that. Great. We are capturing, I mean, you know, adverse events, obviously, as systematically as we can, and insomnia will certainly be included. There's a question in the chat um, by Nasr Bashiri. Apologies if I mispronounced your name. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, um, I was wondering if this has uh, been tested in population where we have uh, substance use and eating disorder, and um, would that lead to addiction to psilocybin? So, uh, so, yeah. Amanda, you can chime in here too, but um, all of the studies that have been done have certainly monitored for um use of psilocybin outside of the study context in follow-up and we have we do not have reason right now to think that that is something that pre people are predisposed to as a result of these interventions and that includes populations who are being treated for addiction um, so actually like the only r01 that i know of right now that's being funded by the nih um, is through the addiction institute for smokers um, and it's showing great promise um, josh is doing a study josh really here is doing a study in methamphetamine use disorder um, so in, in contrary i would say um, we think that this is a promising treatment for substance use disorders and don't have any data um, that is con that is concerning regarding substance use disorder as a result of these treatments Shelly, you have a question. Go go ahead. Uh, this was amazing and powerful um, and exciting. Uh, my question is, do they have to be off all their psychiatric medications to be in this study? Ah, Shelly, thank you for letting me nerd out on this. I was hoping someone would ask. <laughs> yeah, so so the hypothetical risk, right, is, is precipitating serotonin syndrome. These are serotonin agonists and someone who's on an SSRI, you get where I'm going with that. When you look at the cumulative literature, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of people worldwide who have used these medications recreationally, right, and are on all sorts of medications, we actually really don't see trends of serotonin syndrome emerging. Um, so really what we're worried about, so sorry to get back to your exact question, yes, we are going to taper folks off of serotonergic medications, so including SSRIs, SNRIs, um, 
and of second generation antipsychotics that of course have some serotonergic properties. But again, it's less about that serotonin risk and more about not wanting to muddy the waters of our outcomes. So let me continue to nerd out for like 30 seconds. So, right, if we're chronically increasing serotonin in the synaptic cleft with something like an SSRI, those postsynaptic nerve cells are resorbing their serotonin receptors, right? Because they're seeing more serotonin in the synapse. So we don't need as many receptors to gobble up those serotonin molecules. So then we think, okay, if that's the case for folks, right, and we're giving them a serotonin agonist like psilocybin, there are less receptors to interact with that psilocybin. So it's less about, again, the safety risk, although of course that's there, right? This is a really novel treatment and more about not wanting to muddy the waters. We want all those good available serotonin receptors to be able to interact with the psilocybin to exert a downstream effect. Um, and then we don't want to precipitate. Obviously, there's a risk of um, precipitating uh, like psychotic illness, mania. These are things, again, that we really don't, we're not seeing emerge in clinical trials, but we have to be careful of. So we have other exclusions medications. But yeah, the big one is, is to come off serotonergic medications. Great question. I have a question, um, if I may. How, how do um, the clients integrate this experience? I mean, I know there's inter <laughs> integration is a big word here um, in this approach. And how do they talk about <laughs> um, being so resistant or hesitant or fearful and anxious prior to the treatment and now having a newfound sense of freedom around food, if that's even um, an appropriate description, how do they think about that? What do they say? I think we have a little bit of data from the UCSD study. They did report some of their qualitative exit interview data. Um, and I, I think that some of the ways that this is gelling with what they've seen is um, just an increased sense of self-compassion, um, I think is one of the big themes that arises often in these studies um, that can help to reduce that rigidity and also like um, uh, kind of allow for the reality of what their experience has been while also providing care for themselves as they move forward. Um, and I think that might be one of the biggest pieces, but I share your question, Barbara. I'm really interested to see what our participants um, say as well. And Dr. Lorraine was curious to hear from our psychologist. So yeah, Sarah, Lisa, Lindsay, Jess, feel free to chime in. I can't tell whether anyone else is unmuting to take this question, <laughs> but certainly anyone else can chime in. Um, I think that this is a very radically different approach than our common behavioral treatments for anorexia, where we're really focused on change orientation and, and with family involvement, really focused on helping the families change the environment to really intervene on eating disorder behaviors pretty actively. So that's a big part of why we wanted to um, involve family members is that we really want to help them kind of embody this new framework where we're trying to cultivate acceptance, openness, curiosity. We're really asking family members to define what their intentions are for their participation as well, how they want to show up in supporting their, their young adult um, child or family member. Um, and really think about how they can create a space at home that maybe is a little bit different than how they've typically engaged with their um, family member around their illness. Um, so that might look like just creating more space for there to be a lot of emotion, um, which can arise certainly in these contexts that might be unsettling, disorienting, confusing, distressing, um, and hopefully helping them support their, their loved one to make sense of all of that in a different way. Um, I think we're, we're kind of trying to kind of get ahead of um, the potential challenges that could come up in families having expectations for radical change, dramatic change, and really help them stay the course and, and kind of take a supportive and accepting stance with their, their loved one. Um, so I just, I guess that's the kind of short version of the way we're thinking about this. If anyone else wants to add, feel free. No, I think that was right on point, um, Sarah. I just want to uh, go back to the slide. Well, you don't have to show it, obviously, but the slide about the snow globe. And we can be thinking about the snow settling for the um, participant in the study, but we're also thinking about the snow settling within the family system. 
So we really want to be mindful to involve the family because some unexpected changes may arise and that may shake up homeostasis. And so we want to help them feel supported and have a sense of how to interact with their loved one if these changes arise. And just to say that some of the, the dramatic changes might not arise too, like, or maybe that the young person wants to be quiet about it and not talk about that with their family. So we want to have families have a good orientation to the study. So they have a sense of what to expect and feel supported through the process as well. Christina, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there is another question about the exploration of existential distress um, potentially being relevant here. Um, would you like to add to that question? I can add a little bit. I think certainly that's something that commonly comes up in this work. Um, one thing that was an interesting comment from the PI of the UCSD study is that developmentally, um, some folks may not be in a place where they've had to grapple with these kinds of questions before. And so that's a big focus of the integration work is really trying to help make meaning. Um, and that may be a new process. And I think there, there's probably the possibility that a lot of grief may come up for young people who've been struggling for some time and have had this illness really um, kind of shake their world and kind of um, this maybe bring about new ways of thinking about things that have never come up before, a lot of questions, a lot of regret. So we want to create the space to really um, help them explore some of that. And again, try to make their own personal meaning of it. Dr. Angie Lynn, you had a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask? Hi, I was just um, wondering, um, you know, Marissa, you mentioned the patient who was just so, so um, scared for change. And um, do you anticipate some challenges with consenting, especially among those folks who are really, you know, find it very scary to let go of this condition? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, this is actually something else we consulted with the UCSD group about. Um, and I think we really need to make sure as we're moving forward uh, in this study that it's really the participant who's interested in doing this work, um, that they're not sort of being uh, pushed forward by family members or other people in their lives. Um, I think that, um, you know, we're really aware that uh, that people could be set up for a really bad experience if they're too, if they're scared, if they're not ready to do it, um, if they're not prepared to engage. Um, and so I do think that that is something that may um, roll some participants out for now, depending on where they are in their disease process. Um, and I will also say that like, we have not published, like, publicized anything about this trial and I'm getting two to three people a week emailing me asking about it. So I think there will be a large number of people who are interested in it even so. Um, and, you know, so I think it's a, a yes and, I think both of those. Um, I know someone asked earlier also about the follow-up. I'm happy to address that. Um, we, the sort of active treatment uh, phase for this trial is around 12 weeks. Um, and then it's sort of between eight and 12 weeks, depending on exactly how things work out. Um, and then we'll be following people formally for a year um, and optional follow-up um, after that um, that we would try and do annually. Um, and our main outcome, I think we didn't say this, is the EDE, which is, is fairly standard. Um, There's a question about music. Where is that? I see it, yeah. Also, it was embedded in there. Um, Amanda, feel free to jump in here. Um, but this is a topic of uh, intense interest in the field. Um, one of our colleagues, Robin Carhart Harris, is particularly here at UCSF and Neuroscape is particularly interested in really exploring um, all of the different uh, aspects of set and setting, really setting and thinking about, you know, what does the music uh, add? What does the lighting add? What do colors in the room add? I think these are areas where we really need to develop um, our understanding more as, as the field progresses. Do you want to add anything to that, Amanda? Okay. I'm, I'm curious about, back to the integration therapy, what models are you pulling from to do that kind of processing? I think there's like a long tradition of doing this work and particularly um, 
uh, MAPS has a lot of great resources that we're pulling from to kind of guide us. Um, we're working really closely with the Tripper team who has lots and lots of experience with doing this work. And I think a lot of it is really drawing on kind of more general psychotherapeutic principles like cultivating an alliance, um, the kind of transpersonal elements of, of the experience, um, again, meaning making. We are also thinking a little bit about pulling in more of an acceptance and commitment based framework for this population, although um, there won't be a lot of explicit skills work or anything like that. It'll be more of kind of a framework for how we're thinking about the, the work and, and exploring what comes up. Thanks for that. We have maybe 30 seconds before one o'clock. Um, and I just wanna take the time to um, express my gratitude um, to you, both of you and to your team and your collaborators um, and taking the time into each of you here who, part who are um, actively engaged in this discussion. Um, it's been really thought provoking, very thoughtful um, and echoing um, Miriam's comment about the sensitivity and humility that you are um, bringing to this work. Um, so thank you very, very much. It was such a pleasure. Take good care, everyone. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to share this work.